Good afternoon from a gloriously sunny and warm London. Welcome back to the Createx stage at COGEX. Please do join in the conversation. It's hashtag createx UK or hashtag COGEX 2021. Um, and make sure that you also post any questions that you would like to ask the panelists in the um, chat function. Um, I'm really excited and really looking forward to this, uh, to this session in particular. I don't know why, maybe it's just because for me, it's something really, really new. And it's looking at the impact of crypto art and the impact it has on both the production and the creation of art, but also on the collecting of art. So to lead us through the, the session, I'd like to introduce Wenny Teo. Wenny is a specialist in modern and contemporary art at the Courthold Institute. Hi, thank you so much. And uh, welcome everyone to our panel, NFTs and the Future of Digital Art. Um, now the term NFT is probably familiar to most of you um, as uh, earlier this year in March, um, a work by the American artist Mike Winkleman, also known as Beeple, uh, sold for a historic 69 million US dollars at a Christie's auction. Um, and it was really the sale that then triggered or uh, precipitated an explosion of interest in um, NFTs and uh, led to you know, quite vociferous debates about the role that blockchain technology um, has come to play and could come to play in um, the ownership, distribution, circulation, and control of not only artworks, but also a panoply of digital objects and digital media. Um, so we'll be discussing this in our panel today, but we thought that a good way to begin uh, would be to sort of try and uh, define what exactly uh, NFTs are. Um, and so to put it uh, as simply as possible, NFTs or non-fungible tokens uh, are units of data that are stored on the blockchain that both certify a digital object to be unique and also authenticate uh, the ownership of that object. Um, so in other words, even though a digital object, be it a work of art or a meme, uh, can of course be shared and repl replicated ad infinitum online, um, its provenance can always be traced uh, on the blockchain, uh, which allows us to define uh, this digital object as a commodity that is scarce, unique, and original. So an NFT thus offers indisputable answers to um, questions uh, that have long plagued art historians, such as who owns, uh, previously has owned, and who creates, created an original work, um, <clears throat> as well as how many uh, copies, uh, there, uh, as well as uh, which, of, which is the original out of the many different copies of digital objects that are out there. Um, so several different digital objects can be linked to an NFT, including photographs, audio, video clips, and other types of digital files, um, which has meant that NFTs are now being used to commodify a vast range of virtual ephemera, including art, memes, sport collect collectibles, and even uh, famously uh, tweets. So um, like cryptocurrencies, the distributive logic is ostensibly one of decentralization, not only granting artists and content creators more control over their work, <clears throat> but making the sale and resale of artwork in the secondary market more transparent and so on. So what that means is that in theory, the blockchain uh, eliminates the need uh, for middlemen <clears throat> and the traditional art world gatekeepers, um, blue chip galleries, museums, and so on. Um, so this uh, could potentially create you know, a more democratic situation, what's often been referred to as a kind of democratization of the art world, not only in terms of diversity and inclusivity, but also you know, kind of really um, uh, dethroning or upsetting conventions of, of what art is, you know, the kind of high art object uh, for an elite audience on a pedestal and so on. So there's a real kind of shift in a way, both in the, the, the kind of work being produced and sold. Um, as well as the kind of mechanisms and, and distribution of, of material online um, and so on. <clears throat> For those who are more skeptical of this development, however, uh, the uh, NFTs simply represent the kind of absolute commodification of art object of the art object and the kind of monetization of art. Um, 
So beyond this kind of more polarizing or black and white view, um, this panel is going to look at some of the nuances of that um, and <clears throat> to examine uh, the potential of NFTs to um, disrupt and reinvent art world infrastructures uh, in perhaps more meaningful way and to consider what that might mean for the future of, of digital art. Um, so this panel was first conceived by myself and, uh, and of course, Andrea uh, Baron Kelly, who I will introduce now. Hi, Andrea. Perhaps you can introduce yourself. I think that might be yeah. more fruitful. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, I think that would be. And so Andrea will be speaking for about five minutes, followed by our next speaker, Mazdaq Sani. And uh, finally, um, our last speaker, who was one of the co-founders of the Kaikun Art Collective. Um, but first, Andrea, uh, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm a physicist by background, and uh, I'm at the Turing at City University and at the Alan Turing Institute, where we have built this token economy group within the economic data science team. And the, the, the group is built around an old interest of mine, uh, which is how we humans interplay with technology, and specifically lately with blockchain technology which is a space where a lot of the attention is still on the design aspects of it. But NFTs show clearly that when you put that, uh, such a powerful uh, technology in the wild, humans uh, arrange themselves uh, and use it in an expected way. So my interest in NFTs is already in the world non-fungible. The blockchain, I guess, I mean, most, most of us know, are uh, built, were created with the idea of doing digital currencies. So fungibility was a key aspect. And it stayed like that for like approximately five years. And then in 2014, 15, people started playing with this non-fungibility, the fact that you cannot replicate, that, that the two tokens are intrinsically different from one another. And this became famous in 2017 with CryptoKitties. I guess most of the audience may be familiar with them, but they were collectible cats, living cats, living on, on a blockchain, images of cats that started to be traded for like large amounts of money. And they were uh, somehow famous for a little bit on the press as a symptom of the craziness of the cryptocurrency bubble. So that if you Google a little bit and look for past uh, newspaper articles, the first newspaper article speaking of NFTs, they said, well, this is a clear symptom that the blockchain should be shut down right now. The bubble did explode in 2018. The technology went under the radar and resurfaced first with gamers, but that was still kind of a niche. And as Wendy was saying at the beginning of this year, with the Bebo auction, then all the media conquered that. So with, with some collaborators, we did this exercise of mapping the landscape so far. We found that approximately, uh, we found data for approximately 5 million already NFTs, which were traded 6 million times. And a first question I'm interested in to, in general, and I guess it's very relevant about democratization that Wendy was saying, is that this is a technology which was conceived, the blockchain in general and NFTs, to open up the art market, to democratize it, to make the access easy. However, what we have seen with cryptocurrencies is that within the crypto space, the self-organization, the social dynamics has recreated a lot of structures of the financial system. Ex exchanges somehow centralized, uh, fluxes of money, you have very influential actors, the so-called whales, dark web marketplaces, centralized trade to an extent. So is this going to happen also for NFTs? We are still in an initial phase, but you can imagine that some, and we have clear indication that some marketplaces could start to sell only very curated selection of uh, NFTs. And this could have an impact on the future life of the artist, on the career of the artist, on the art itself. What about the cultural evolution? This is another long sending interest of mine, that how we build social norms around technology, how we norms change, and how uh, culture evolve in itself. So now we have all the data, and that's 
interesting from my point of view. Like I see this as a sort of wonderful aquarium to, to ask all these questions. We have all this data and we can ask, for example, whether the price of a sale has an influence of our production uh, following that. For example, in, in, this, in this paper, which is called Mapping the NFT Revolution, and it's um, on the preprint archive, you can find it. We, we play this simple exercise, which is try and predict the, sec the price of the secondary sale of an NFT. Of course, you have that the previous sale is highly informative. However, we, uh, using some simple AI technique, you have that the, the visual aspect of the digital object associated to an NFT is enhances the prediction of the price it will be sold afterwards uh, at. So that's an indication that, that there is something going on. Of course, it's very early. Also, our study is very preliminary. But this is another interesting question. Another interesting question is, we built this network. I had a slide, but I don't know whether we, we can see it now, uh, of uh, buyers and sellers, where you put a link every time two individuals have exchanged an NFT. And you can see that they tend, I mean, actors in the market tend to be specialized on collections or different kind of NFTs. However, you have already cross-pollination, for example, between the gaming industry, collectibles. The NBA plans to do a collectible uh, in the next season already or in two seasons, and art. So this is all uh, the reasons why I find this extremely fascinating. And at this point, I would leave uh, the, the, the word again to Wenny and probably to Mazdak for their introduction. Absolutely fascinating. The work you do is, is, is uh, the work you do is so interesting in this kind of you know kind of data data analytics or art analytics in the sense that you know with with the technology with you know the kind of clear map as it were or path that's um set out through the blockchain ledger you know one is able to very kind of clearly visualize in a way a lot of these uh you know the, the history of the object you know the social life of the object and of course i'm calling an object but it's uh you know completely immaterial right um and I think this is extremely useful for, for research and so on. But I was really um, interested and drawn to what you were saying about this idea of, of um, you know, uh, how the pattern that emerges tends to uh, also recreate, um, you know, pre-existing structures and, and dynamics of power and perhaps also structures of inequality as well. Um, and, you know, we know, for instance, that, um, you know, in spite of the kind of decentralized and, and, and freeing potential of, um nfts and you know even cryptocurrencies that there is a huge for instance environmental cost right to to, to running the servers and so on <clears throat> in a way also recreating other structures of power and and um uh you know extractivist uh concerns i guess that have traditionally fueled uh, not just the art world but the world uh, in general um and so I, I you know i'm 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 really interested in how then um you know, the research might, in a way, be quite. Uh, you know, the conclusions you might draw might be quite pessimistic. You know, in the sense that you you end up having simply a replication of, of the system again. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just wondering what your th thoughts might be on that. No, that's a very good point. Uh, I don't think you ever replicate exactly what was outside, and so you always have new norms that emerge co-evolve with the technology co-evolve with the use of the technology for example uh, a thing that is very new to humans to humanity in somehow that is embedded in nfts is this immutability of smart contracts so what we will do with it what if we then want to change something but actually the technology doesn't allow you to shall we just collectively decide to ignore a previously established contract? We, we, don't need, we don't have this and we need it not only for this space. This is a major question. On the environmental cost, this situation isn't like fantastic at the moment. There are a lot of technology uh, push, however, towards cleaner, much cleaner blockchain. So this seems to be a transient. But uh, on my prediction on whether this will replicate it, I, I, of course, have no clear idea. I suspect that 
NFTs uh, are really a powerful technology which will probably remain in the world of art and also extend to other domains. Uh, on the centralization, however, I'm a little bit pessimistic. It seems every time I study a system, it seems like we tend to go towards some sort of centralization, probably not as strong as the previous one and with an easier access where the incumbent is less powerful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, re I'm really interested as we've spoken about before in this kind of distinction perhaps between decentralization and democratization, because these are quite different things, right? I mean, one refers to a kind of shift in structure or system perhaps and the other one is is you know for me at least a kind of ideology you know a way of thinking um uh, and, I, and i'm hoping that this is something that we can uh, talk about all four of us actually to talk about a little bit later but first perhaps um Maztec, would you like to to introduce yourself briefly and, and and talk a little bit on your uh on on um, nfts and your perspective on on how that might reshape the work that you do yeah of course uh, I'm Mazdak. I'm co-founder and CEO of Avant Art. Um, Avant Art is is the biggest online community of of young people engaged with the visual arts. Um, our community spread all over the all over the world, but is mainly from a, a new generation. So so more than two million of them are under thirty five, and we work with um, a really diverse range of of leading contemporary artists, from Jenny Holzer and Sai Wei Chang to Elm Green and Dragset. Um, you know, introducing them to our community, both through uh, storytelling and, and context around um, their practice, but also through collaborations that, that produce high quality sculpture editions, print editions, works on paper, objects that try and make collecting their work more accessible to the next generation of, of patrons and collectors. Um, and I guess the, the purpose of our platform is to, to help make discovering and collecting art radically more accessible than it is today and at the same time retain the elevation of quality and 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 the depth of thought and expression that can make art such a transformative human experience um, and a lot of what we think about um, day to day is how can we leverage technology to help bring art in line with other areas of culture that have really scaled like you know scaled their impact like um, music and fashion in terms of things that, that young people really care about and want to collect. Um, so on one very immediate level, you know, NFTs and, and sort of the explosion of interest and debate around them this year was, you know, really the first time since we've been building our community that it felt like the world um, agreed with us uh, on how exciting this intersection between art and technology really was. Um, but I think more, more fundamentally, we we believe there are there are two main things that are central to um, to to art fulfilling its potential in terms of breadth of impact and their their access and trust um, and both of those things are uh, can be significantly impacted by NFTs and, and the technology that that they're built on. Um, so in, in terms of access, you know this this uh, feverish hype that we had in in twenty twenty one around around NFTs ultimately put art on the front cover of every major newspaper and publication and made it just so much more prominent in the public consciousness and discourse. Um, but I think the really interesting thing was, was NFTs also provided an entry point for thousands and thousands of people who had never considered themselves art collectors and never bought art before um, to become owners of a cultural object for the first time. And, you know, despite some of the reflexes from corners of the art world, I think it would be a, a really fantastic thing if NFTs can sustainably become accessible entry points for new collectors, be they crypto kids or just people who aren't, you know, don't live near a gallery or don't feel comfortable in one. And yeah, if they can continue putting art on the front cover of the New York Times and, and, and also provide a, um, you know, a, a way for artists to explore digital art that's financially viable and supports their broader practice, then, then even better. Um, you know, the second thing that, that we think is really central to art fulfilling its potential is, is trust. Um, and that I think is where the underlying technology that the NFTs are built on could have a really transformative impact on 
on the art world. You know, there's a huge amount of um, opacity baked into the system by which art's been bought and sold for hundreds of years. And the blockchain technology that, that NFTs are built on actually enable a, a decentralized system of authentication and traceability, which, yeah, could really profoundly enhance the trust that any individual collector can have in the piece that they want to collect and therefore just this, the, the health of the, the whole ecosystem. Um, but I think most excitingly of all, um, and, and Andrea alluded to it with, with smart contracts, you know, most excitingly, certainly for a, a company um, like Have an Art, which, you know, really is is focused on supporting artists um, and and fostering that health in the broader art world. You know, we believe that the most revolutionary thing about NFTs is not big auction results. Um, it's that within the smart contract of an NFT, you can inscribe how the piece is then going to behave and the rules that govern it after that sort of primary dissemination where it comes into the world for the first time. Um, you know, you can define that, for example, um, every time a work changes hands, a royalty is paid to the artist. And as simple as that may sound, it's something that could genuinely transform artist economics and um, yeah, also make the secondary marketplace that is vibrant and creative and, and somewhere that directly supports artistic practice. So, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk lots about um, all of the obstacles and the environmental impact and, and you know, the uh, desire of some custodians to sort of re-centralize or, you know, the lack of curation. But, you know, I think I think we believe there's a huge amount of potential in in NFTs and 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 the technology underlying them for really meaningful change in the art world that benefits both artists and, and collectors um, at large. Thank you so much, Massa. That was really rich and I think there's a lot to 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 really think about there, especially in you know what you're saying about there being, you know, the role of the artist being one that's you know traditionally been quite precarious and you know the artist is usually kind of ends up being the first person to lose control of the work once it kind of leaves their hands um and there is of course as you say a, a tremendous potential there in a way for um you know this new model a new system to, to rewrite some of these um to redress some of these these concerns um and on that note i wonder if we could now hear from hannah um who is uh, one of the co-founders of um, Fabulous Cake and Collective. And I'll, I'll let you in introduce the, the group and your work as well, Hannah. <laughs> Thank you. So hi, everyone. So my name is Hannah, and I'm one of the co-founders of Cake and. It's an arts collective alongside Tanya Cruz and Isabel Ramos. And so we, yeah, we create in so many different mediums. I'm sharing, sharing a video right now of um, the different kinds of works we do. But essentially what we're doing is we build a metaverse together. So we really consider like new systems, new ways of new structures. And also we reflect on the contemporary as though now it's history. We also explore consequences fictitiously. So when you apply it to the blockchain and the future of digital art and NFTs, we really have been looking at how like we, how when you create a metaverse, um, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. But basically, we're like looking at how these new structures can be made. And obviously, the blockchain, what it allows, it allows for a space for us to create new systems and ways of interacting. I think I think it was originally made for finance. And for us, we're really interested in how can you replace finance with other values? How can we put different things on the blockchain, like wisdom? What about self-sovereignty? What about um, owning our own data so that you can create more equity so that people can anyone in the world their data is valuable for different reasons so it's like ways of distribution that could be not just about numbers it could be something it could be much more diverse than that so the images that you can see right now they are a game that we recently made and it's called wisdoms for love 3.0 and this game that we made was really it basically you can collect tokens but all the tokens are free so it's really about creating this space where anyone can collect and there is no there is no like boundary like even with even with nfts you have to learn about the blockchain you need to learn how to make metamask all kinds of things an e-wallet and even just get into the culture and the community and what we did with this game was we really tried to replicate 
like the smart contract, but we made a moral contract. We tried to um, create the idea of a tokenization and collectibles. We tried to look at how we can, yeah, digital artworks and how to preserve them. And even in the game, it's a decision making game. So it's the idea that when you look at a metaverse and you have to make all these decisions in the game, you realize how difficult it is to make decisions in life and kind of reflect on our responsibility if we are creating this new space that we need to be more responsible human beings that things are not so easy so we need dialectic thinking we really need to recognize these very opposing different views often and how we are contradictive and how we how just the world is so complicated so when we create cohabiting spaces in the metaverse we need to be incredibly insightful about that. So there's a really amazing um, quote that I'm going to read, which is by John Perry Barlow, who wrote the Declaration of Independence in Cyberspace. So he said that it is an act of nature and it grows itself from our collective actions. We will create a civilization of the mind. May it be more humane and fair than the world and governments have made before. So what we're really looking at is like, you know, we have this, we have cyberspace, we have the potentials of metaverse, we have the blockchain. So we have all these elements that are growing and emerging and new systems are starting to emerge. And yes, it is very centralized. And yes, in lots of ways, I know there's like a huge, like um, Andrea said, like he, from his research, he can see that people still move towards centralization. However, what John Perry Barlow really is saying is like, actually this space is ours and we can claim it and we can change the way that it could be. And we need to really free ourselves from those things. So for example, going back to our game, it wasn't about money at all, but it replicated all the actions of the blockchain. So therefore we were trying to like, look at, can we remove ourselves from um, this hyper-capitalist like way of perceiving the blockchain, even though obviously it's integrally, um integrally is to do with um finance but what about if the blockchain could have other things like wisdom so um i think my presentation is almost over but i also another part that i really wanted to express when we're looking at nfts and the future of digital art is that i think what it really shows is how much people need to create and how how innate it is for us to just consume imagery, like we're addicted to imagery. We want to either collect, we want to express ourselves. And I think the idea of an artist is much, it's not so defined as you are creative and you are not creative. Actually to be, we need to express ourselves, to feel good about ourselves, to feel like we have purpose. So maybe we can broaden that perspective of, creativity and that actually all humans need that as one of our basic needs and yeah so I hope that <laughs> this was helpful. Thank you so much Hannah that was brilliant. Um, Andrea you had, a, you had a comment that you wanted to read. Yeah uh, so I, I'm very in, interested in this metaverse where you have tokens but tokens are free they can potentially be I guess there is infinite supply of these tokens and therefore however if they have any feature, like for example, the, the order in which they have produced, how can you guarantee that a market doesn't emerge? For example, I don't know, I want the first release of that particular object, digital object in the metaverse, and I'm willing to pay a little sum to you to have it. Would this reintroduce a sort of like monetization even there? Because in the end, the world we live in is, was like this. I mean, humanity yeah. arrived in a world where there was no currency and now we have currency so well, I think there is hierarchy. like naturally there will be hierarchy people love to look up to things so i don't think we just have preposterous hierarchy i i don't disagree with the hierarchy i don't disagree with like things being finance being there. numbers are so amazing because it's so like direct and you have an answer that's an incredible like it explains so much of our existence so i don't think that that's something we should deter from in the sense of um, it being a structure that exists. But what the problem is, is people cannot detach the blockchain and this new structure from finance. They find it so hard to have a conversation about it away from finance. And I know it is a financial tool. However, we could have so many different types of currency. So for example, DAOs and the idea of creating your own currency, you can, yes, it might be financial, but there is an element where 
it also means that people can create much more like um, create communities that have like different purposes and different goals that are much more specific to their community. And there's other things like what happens if we start um, putting our wisdom on a blockchain and then give it to our ancestors, like things like that. There's just so many ways in which we can use it. And I think the problem is, is like, because the winning the game of the earth is to do with basically numbers is to do with um, finance and that's the problem we need to have more um, diversional ways of winning the game of the earth so it's not about deterring from it it's just like being allowing people's minds to like be able to have that space to think about the blockchain not associated to finance very very briefly to comment on this this, this goes exactly in the direction uh, i was mentioning before of this technology which was invented with the digital currency in mind and then uh, the arts are so important in like giving new directions or suggesting new possible directions and also everyone still thinks about blockchain as new technology but you mentioned DAOs which are digital autonomous organizations for those <laughs> And, and it shows the dimension of community and, and even of social experiment of, it, of which blockchain wants its release. But I leave the, the floor. Well, no, well, from our collective minds, it's a creation from our collective conversations with one another. Absolutely. And that will, that will determine the direction. So that's why we need to talk about it away from finance. <laughs> and, and bringing your, your broader point, slightly prosaically to, to NFT specifically is what you're saying also that you know all of the focus is on how NFTs can um, can provide scarcity for digital assets and that's tradable and that's you know that can be monetized whereas actually the possibilities of a smart contract and all of the different rules you can create are much richer than simply this yeah mm -hmm. non fungible tradable uh, aspect yeah and even like on your end it's like okay so it's about obviously providing for the artist the artist needs to have a sustainable income but then alongside that it's the integrity of the artist it's the history of the artist it's all these other elements that are so integral and so it's, so it's not really just about that and it's also yeah creating new systems that we we all know that our system doesn't work fully we know it works in so many amazing ways but we know it's not perfect that's why we're always trying to change it so like creating that space for people to think about that change is actually very hard sometimes and that's what's amazing about the blockchain it proposes a new system and puts it into action and it's not perfect but there's possibilities there but speculative energy is so powerful people literally trip over speculative energy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, speaking of, of speculative energy and speculative futures, we have a really interesting question. We have a couple of interesting questions, but I, I'm afraid we're only going to have time for uh, a question by Saskia, which is um, about, the, about um, the past rather than the future. How is the blockchain approach going to change art history? The narratives and mystery around biographies of artworks can be more interesting than the art itself, um, but wouldn't this uncertainty be lost? Um, yeah, and I think that's a really uh, interesting uh, question to do with, you know, this idea of provenance and and the kind of fixation that there still remains with, you know, the, the kind of history of ownership. Um, and it's it's one of the contradictions that with, I know what's not exactly a new technology, but, you know, in the way the, the kind of attitude of digital art and its dematerialized form, past kind of postmodernism and so on, we end up once again with, uh, you know, questions of ownership and authenticity uh you know gaining ground as 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 being central at least to to what nfts are in a sense um and i'm you know and obviously you know the history of art is is one that is um you know riddled with with uh, with uncertainty and ambiguities and unknown uh, stories and i wonder i think looking at um hannah's uh and the kicking collective's work and the sort of practices that are coming out of uh digital forms of art today i think that these uh you know perhaps new narrative strands uh would emerge that would in a way move away from the biographic because it's so explicitly stated in the structure of the nft itself um towards you know other kind of investigative means i think and that's uh one of the uh perhaps the potential of of you know the future of of art history as well um what did you guys think of um, Hannah? I mean, what what is your feeling about that? 
to do with um, provenance. Well, great art will always like you can feel it. You know, you feel that it's amazing and it's incredible, and it gives you rich, provides you richness and insight and wisdom. Like that will never be taken away. No matter, even if it's like, even if it adapts, like I just don't think that would go away if it's really great art and it it provides a, a piece of like wisdom and information for the future. Like I don't think it matters in that sense. Um, and provenance in that sense. But then I do think the way that we're going to experience art is going to be just far more gamified. Like, it's not just about, like, I don't know, when Yuval Noah Harari did, like, Homo sapiens, wrote Homo sapiens and stuff like that, He the idea of, like, narrative being the way that humans understand the world became such a, like, big topic of conversation. And it was always spoken about that we now understand the world through narratives. And this is really the easiest way to explain uh humanity in a very easy way but I think it's going beyond that it's like we understand the world through gamification so I think the way we're going to experience art like we're experiencing finance is just going to become more gamified because it's fun and there's so many different approaches it can have narrative it can have collection it can have like novelty it can have um forking pathways and so I think I really think that might be the more direction that art goes into even if it's not so explicit i think there's something really interesting though in the in the contradictions of this sort of early iteration of of, of nfts and, and sort of you know i think i think the idea that um you know you have this you have this technology that has like radical potentiality but what we're talking about is ownership and what we're talking about is biography and like, you know, these structures or themes that are very, very traditional are, are persisting and people are trying to sort of centralize, uh, you know, the traditional custodians of art are, are trying to sort of centralize the processes that are sort of systemically decentralized. I think all of that is a really interesting self-contradiction or, or, you know, yeah, I'm sure it's uh, very in relation to, to all of the movements that, that Andrea you you study, but yeah, I find that fascinating. I agree, <laughs> but I think we need to uh, exactly. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we are out of time, and this was really a kind of quick blitz through <laughs> the potential of NFT, and and it's really kind of very multi multifaceted forms, and hopefully just the beginning of a of a continuing dialogue and conversation. Um, but thank you, um, everyone, uh, for attending, and uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you so much. Um, that was super interesting. Uh, brilliant. So uh, moving on to the rest of the day, please join us back at two o'clock. We've got really exciting afternoon, actually. You can learn about a virtual midsummer forest, new collaborative platforms for music, um, designing for sustainability, the collective mega power of gaming. And then uh, to close the day, we have Niall Rogers in conversation with Jack Savaretti. So we'll see you back on the Createx stage, hashtag Createx UK, uh, two o'clock. See you then. <laughs>